everyone. Uh, for something a little different, I've decided to invite uh, ben Christensen from Cisco to talk about IoT gateways and this is a bit of a teaser for what uh, we've been talking about in Lenaro and, and things that our CTO has been playing with as he likes to say. So um, I thought it'd be kind of fun to start talking about IoT and the home gateway. So, Thank you. And uh, so this is my first time at uh, Linaro, by the way, Connect, and uh, it's great. Uh, hope to uh, come again uh, next time. So, um, yeah, let me start here. Um, first, I'll just uh, like uh, overview over the uh, presentation. First, I'll give a like a uh, brief overview over why we want to look into this area, and then a use case example of of this gateway here that we uh, productized. And of course, the end is that that uh, the lessons learned is hopefully useful for for other people than just uh, internally within Cisco. All right. So, um, just um, uh, to begin with, so IoT. What do we mean with uh, IoT? And and this is not the perfect uh, model, but at least it uh, refines the client-server model a little bit, because every time, well, most of the time when we uh, think about uh, a computing setup, it's usually a, a client and a server, but, but uh, in IoT, it's, it's uh, so much more complicated. So there's the people, of course, uh, that uh, are putting more devices online. There's the data, and data being transformed from sensor data to actually uh, information, higher level information. And then there's the, uh, the actual things, the sensors and actuators collecting all these uh, uh, data. And then, in between all this is uh, what, what we call uh, the process, the infrastructure, and that's uh, where we think there's a business, uh, where we can make some products and uh, where we can make a, a change. Uh, and then, so what's, why do we want to even build a product in the first place? And of course, uh, uh, it's always fun to tinker with uh, all the, the boards and so on and get it uh, to run at home. Uh, I've done it myself. and. Probably all of you have done it also, uh, to get a light to turn on and, and to talk to a, uh, a thermostat or something else over Wi-Fi or Zigbee or Bluetooth or something like that. But uh, does it actually make sense as a product? And uh, this is some estimation, and I don't care too much if it's you know, precisely true, but at least it, it addresses or points into areas where uh, IoT actually makes uh, sense. So for instance, just more efficiency, asset utilization, uh, employee productivity, supply chain, logistics, and uh, customer experience, which is the biggest one, and then uh, also in the uh, innovation category. So basically making existing uh, stuff more efficient and then also open up into new areas. And then uh, where uh, does it uh, make the most uh, impact? So we see uh, at the top line uh, there's uh, uh, North America, Canada, uh, United States, and uh, Europe. And uh, where's the biggest economies? So, like those uh, uh, combined, gives the biggest uh, dots. So, United States uh, and uh, uh, Europe is really uh, the target market here, where IoT really can uh, make a difference. All right. So, so why don't we just do it? Basically, like what's what's uh, to stop us? So, uh, what we have experienced, and this is not just us, but uh, is uh, basically. The number one is, uh, as is also the theme of this uh, uh, today, is uh, security, trust, and privacy. So if that fails, you know, it's game over. We can, like, nobody wants to use it, nobody, uh, we cannot sell it as a product, it's fine for, for the home development and have fun with it, but we cannot sell it as a product. That's just the number one concern or challenge. And then uh, such things as uh, device management uh, to update boxes with new uh, firmware. Uh, and also as a service provider, for instance, uh, you want really to be able to manage all the devices in the field. Um, and then uh, data analytics, scalability, uh, rules engines, like all this data collected, how do we make sense of it? Um, it's not trivial, like everybody's saying uh, big data and Hadoop and all that stuff. Uh, and that's great, uh, but you also need to know what to look for, because it doesn't just uh, pop up automatically. You really have to know what you're looking for, otherwise it doesn't make sense to collect all this data. It's just, you know, filling up storage. 
Um, and then there's the regulatory and uh, compliance aspect. If you want to make a product, like all the radios and, uh, and in, uh, in one of the verticals, healthcare, you really have to be certified to well, also sell, sell it as a product. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, not just in North America, but all over the world. And they have slightly different rules in, in North America and Brazil and Australia and so on, and different uh, frequencies for radios, for instance. And uh, then um, extensibility and tellability, like how to add new uh, functions uh, to your uh, devices. If you want to make a platform or a framework, you really have to have a way for third parties, uh, or even internally, a standardized uh, way of uh, adding new apps to your uh, gateway, in this case, or device. And uh, uh, it's not always uh, uh, obvious, for instance, for a framework, where these uh, abstraction layers, APIs you want to provide uh, should be, uh, and I'll come to it in a moment, um, uh, why it's not uh, trivial. And then, uh, well, one size does not fit all. Like if you want to uh, please all, you please none. You make it, you know, it's either uh, here's the hardware and here's the tool chain, do your stuff, or it's like, okay, you can do this smart energy uh, application, you can turn on and off lights. Like you want something in between so you can address other areas than just smart energy, for instance, with your platform. Uh, so those are the, the more technical ones. And then there's also a user experience and business model, which is, you know, uh, also challenges, but uh, for another session, I think uh, they can easily take up time uh, as well to, to go into, or can, we can use a lot of time to go into them. And also, uh, for instance, the user experience is uh, actually uh, what is uh, normally creating uh, uh, most tension with the number one concern, security, trust, and privacy, because making it easy to use also usually makes it uh, less uh, secure because you don't want to type in passwords and, and all that stuff. You just want to use it. All right, so that's what we experienced. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll now go into, uh, well, a real uh, life use case. So, so uh, these four areas was um, uh, basically, uh, for apps was basically what we uh, researched that would be a market. So security first. When people are asked to tell you, well, first of all, everybody has their own uh, great idea for an app, and that's, that's awesome. Me too. Um, you want to control the, the garage door opening and closing and so forth. But when you then ask, so would you pay like $50 for that each month? Uh, 30, 10, 5, $1. Then it gets a little bit more tricky, or, well, more precise, because then it's more about for instance, security. People actually want to pay maybe $5 or more per month to secure your family uh, or your grandma somewhere else or mother uh, and so forth. So security and uh, family safety is number one. And uh, then uh, health is number two to make sure that, uh, for instance, family members also uh, stay healthy and can get in contact with uh, emergency uh, uh, people to help them. Um, if there's a, an emergency. And then uh, third is energy management or smart energy. So basically to save on your energy bill and to have some smarts inside your, your home to, to, uh, to control that. And then the last one, lifestyle, home automation, is more like the fun stuff, but people really don't want to pay for it when it comes down to it. It's just, it's always fun to talk about, and <laughs> but uh, you no, know, that's not something people want to pay for. Um, so. Uh, so that's the apps, and then uh, we try to break it down a little bit because it's, it's uh, you know, there's lots of components uh, to, uh, to put up a whole IoT end-to-end -end system. And uh, so we've been breaking them down into these uh, eight boxes. So for instance, there's the CPE, which is like one of these, a gateway or something like that. And then there's the software stack on the CPE, uh, the apps on top of that, uh, and then the actual sensors and, and actuators, and the whole infrastructure, the networking, like to the back end or inside the house also, uh, and then the remote management to update the boxes, uh, not just the, the gateway, but also the uh, sensors and actuators themselves. Um, and then the companion devices or apps, so, so you can control uh, uh, your home basically. 
and then uh, cloud services, uh, backend services. Um, and uh, we, uh, you know, think we can, uh, as Cisco, uh, deliver on some of these uh, boxes, like the CPE and the CPE software, not so much the apps, um, and uh, not so much the companion a uh, apps, also and devices, um, but uh, wired and, and remote management we have done before also. Um, and by the way, so the, the group I'm uh, within uh, inside Cisco is uh, the same group that has been doing set-top boxes and gateways and cable modems for, for many years. So it's, the way we think of, of this box is um, it's a set-top box without video, but uh, everything else applies the same, security and uh, management and... Uh, so uh, if you mm -hmm. don't mind, I've got a Yeah, question. sure. Um, so I've got, um, I've got Ness, I've got uh, okay, yeah, okay. and stuff, I've got Philips light bulbs, I've got some other bits and pieces. Um, and all of these require separate little gateways or uh, devices to it. So, yep. you know, do you see a future where you can combine them into one box virtually? I mean, how, how will that work? It's, it's, it's yes, so a completely separate stack. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, what I'll show in a bit also is that uh, so the idea with this one was also to do as the original Cisco router, so to combine all those protocols into one unit sure. that they would transfer to, to IP, basically. Uh, so there's uh, C-Wave, uh, Bluetooth, and ZigBee, and uh, Bluetooth sure, LE, and NFC the inside the box. the connectivity, but in each of my separate little boxes for Nest, and there's well, a so separate for instance, little the set of services, and they update the devices differently. And, I mean, standardization yeah, can yeah. drive you down the route of same, so you could serve as many different types, but are you ever going to get there? Or? Well, so uh, we can control the hue, light bulb, and so on, so it's bypassing the, the hub from Philips, okay. for instance, so you can oh. do that with this one. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's our goal also, to bypass all those hubs and make this the, yeah. the super hub, and also um, basically send the firmware updates through this one and out to the devices themselves. So you, you, you sort of build a stack of applications and support within your you can say that, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, and when we say applications, we usually, you know, it's always yeah, like, yeah. what do you mean by an app? But we want to make this platform where we support all the sensors and actuators, and then we can build, you know, user interfaces or apps on, on top of right. it. So that, that's the goal. So, so bypassing all those uh, silos. Right. What about the reach of the, that box in the home? Like, you know, if it's a small apartment, then yeah, one box might be enough. But if like my sprinklers had, sprinkler heads each have like a some sensor or whatever. Yep. I mean, there's got to be some connector that's connecting these, the main gateway to these. It's probably an intermediate gateway or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this box is uh, primarily meant for for inside the home, um, and uh, uh, but uh, most of these protocols, for instance, CP and some of the other ones, you can do these mesh networks with repeaters placed around the home or even outside if you want to extend it. So, so that's the plan with, with that. But also, if it's inside, you know, basically spray these around the, the home, just like you have uh, Wi-Fi routers and, and stuff like that to, to cover the whole home with sufficient uh, coverage of the radios. So for instance, we had a, a request for a customer um, in uh, uh, middle, uh, that, that's in America. They wanted to spray these uh, all over a city, for instance, to do uh, monitoring and uh, of people and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, so this, so we said, well, this is not the right device for that because, first of all, it's supposed to be indoor, uh, and we have to do some modification. Um, but uh, you know, uh, and that's I'm comes to that also. Like every customer, every service provider, everyone who wants to buy this has their own idea of what they want to use it for. And for instance, scaling up. Uh, doing mess networks with these ones, uh, uh, it's not obvious how you would do it, uh, but it can be done. In terms of protocols, are you seeing any uh, um, more support for LoRa? I guess we spoke about connecting the city or something like that. Uh, so what, what there was the protocol for? LoRa, L-O-R-E. Oh, yeah, no, no. No, uh, uh, no like we... Uh, it's supposed to have the range that lets you connect. You know. Talking to, I uh, want to wait for the uh, Wi-Fi uh, right. uh, AH uh, uh, specification to settle. Okay. Before I want to 
do it. But we have talked to people here who wanted to have the, the more than uh, up to well, up to uh, 20 miles uh, yeah. of coverage. And, you know, <laughs> that's great, but uh, yeah, that's that's way too good. Do you think that's going to still stabilize for now? Yeah. So my uh, opinion is that it will stabilize around Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi standards. But you know. Let's wait to see what happens. <laughs> but that's, that's my, uh, what I've seen so far, that's where the industry is going. Yeah. Right. So, uh, let me just, yeah. So, so basically these are the areas that we are actively uh, engaged with. Uh, like application framework and device management and hardware and uh, some community participation. And the community participation is also a bit tricky since there's so many of them, and uh, everyone wants to make their own standards and so on, and that we know that the whole game. And so basically, we just want to monitor what's going on in all of them or most of them, and then uh, you know pick what's best for each one because we don't see a clear um, uh, winner yet, uh, number one of uh, those communities. Okay, so yeah, so this is the box, uh, and this is how it looks. Um, and when you peel the shell off, this is how it looks inside. And uh, so it's actually two boards, main board and daughter board. And uh, so you look at it, one, two. And uh, so the main board is a... Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So uh, the main board is uh, based on basically the uh, beagle bone uh, from TI. Um, and uh, for the... Uh, tech heads, you can see the specs up here, uh, but it's more or less a big bone board. Um, and then we have added the uh, daughter board, which uh, contains all the radios. So the idea is that, uh, that this uh, uh, first one is containing all the radios, and all the radios are, are these, CPC with Bluetooth and NFC, uh, and then you can add more by USB, which is kind of cheating, but still. Um, uh, so this one contains all the radios, and the idea is that you can slim down to that single radio that you really need into your product or you want to, to use if you don't need them all. Um, but uh, often, actually, so it doesn't give that much of a cost uh, optimization. It's a dollar or so, or two maybe, uh, to remove a radio. Uh, but the hard part is, well, in the beginning when, when we had to design the, the radio so they don't interfere and, uh, and for instance, Zigbee and Wi-Fi can uh, be used at the same time because that's not since they are in the same spectrum. That's not uh, trivial. Um, so it's uh, fairly easy to just pull one out and, uh, and save a dollar on each uh, device. But usually when, uh, when people say, for instance, what, uh, why do we need the NFC in that device? And uh, then, well, then, okay, you'll save 50 cents if we pull out the antenna and so on. Then say, well, we might come up with a use case where we can swipe a card and identify use of our healthcare um, uh, vertical uh, if there's multiple users in the same home and, and so forth. So actually sometimes uh, they, they like to have the opportunity to, to expand. And that's the idea of the box uh, also. And also, um, well I haven't put all the certifications in here, but there's a lot of different certification we have to uh, have the device uh, approved with uh, before we can send it out as a, as a product. And then um, just inside the box, so it's a terrible uh, pictogram, but uh, so the blue uh, box is uh, the software inside the box. So basically, uh, well, I guess there's a box for the hardware itself also, but, but uh, a secure bootloader, much as the one that uh, Comcast uh, presented uh, earlier, since it's that same set of box technology with stage one and two uh, bootloader with the chain of trust, so we always uh, have uh, only signed images that uh, loads on the box. And we can go all the way up to uh, uh, install uh, different uh, uh, applications, on this case OSGI uh, uh, jar files that are signed uh, directly and to verify these are signed by the right uh, party. So basically it's a, a Linux and then uh, drivers for each of the radios and a D-Bus that talks to uh, the processes running on the box. And, uh, we, and we have uh, TR69 here also as the main um, uh, a control plane protocol and a RESTful API uh, to uh, uh, well uh, administer the box. Uh, so it has the, the usual Wi-Fi uh, router uh, admin interface so you can 
add devices and, and remove devices and all that stuff through a web interface, but also RESTful interface if you want to have your companion app to do it. Um, and then the uh, apps themselves. So we um, uh, promote or recommend that people write in uh, Java in uh, the OSGI container, uh, basically because, well, it's a, we can secure that environment uh, fairly well and have it sandboxed. Um, and uh, well, also, uh, uh, we provide the tool chain also so people can you know, go amok with their C and C++ and do all the fancy stuff uh, they want to. Uh, but uh, what we also got as a request from a lot of uh, our customers, service providers, was that they really wanted uh, Android in the first place because of Java and the nice environment and the SDK and all that good stuff we all uh, love. Uh, and then we said, well, um, you get, if you get the Java and, and the whole uh, uh, on runtime deployment, uh, would that be uh, fine? But yeah, sure, uh, because uh, most of, well, our uh, analysis was that uh, most of what is in Android is for, for graphics, for graphic libraries, and uh, there's no screen on this guy, so there's really no reason why we should go into that whole um, uh, well, path with Android for this device. We have Android on other devices and we could do it, but, but we try to keep it uh, super simple uh, with this one. So basically it's a OSGI environment with the APIs for all the radios you can, um, you can hook up to the device and also some management interfaces uh, you can uh, use from the OSGI uh, environment. So that's, that's, uh, that's the stack. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, so I'm very curious to see the uh, Linaro uh, Light uh, group, the IoT group, uh, when they get more active and when uh, they propose a whole stack and so on and, and how that uh, comes to look because like uh, two, three, five years ago when we started this project, uh, it would have been nice to have some sort of reference to go with, and this is just uh, you know, the plain Linux uh, stack, and we just add components as, as we needed them. Um, Was there a reason why you used Java instead of like HTML5 or something like that, like Node.js or some kind of a... Well, uh, HTML5, uh, it doesn't have a screen, so what we could do, we have a Node, for instance, also Node.js running on it, which uh, people like uh, too but uh, mostly because uh, Java is so well known, there's SDKs there, and, uh, and we have, you know, we provide an SDK with Eclipse and uh, with uh, Wizards and so on, but, uh, you know, people like Node.js also, and uh, we have support for that as well, but it's just, uh, it's a nice environment, uh, and it's well documented, um, and you can do uh, runtime deployment and deployment and so forth of uh, Java files in the OSGI environment. Yes, yes. We uh, and actually, it's not a big secret, but the the, the part of this in was just bought by Technicolor, who is the big proponent of uh, all scene. And uh, we've looked at it before, <laughs> uh, but now it'll become more prevalent. That's for sure. And how about the other other uh, like IoT or uh, Fred or those? Yeah. Um, uh, we know about them and we monitor them, but as soon as there's a customer asking for them, or for it in the, in the product, we'll do it. Uh, but, uh, so we're in a coin-operated business, and <laughs> so we uh, do what's, what's mostly, uh, uh, well, what customers want to have, basically. Like sensors and actuators devices? Okay, yeah, so it's a very good question. <laughs> the whole provisioning of uh, sensors and actuators because um, what uh, is usually done, because it's a hard problem, or it, it involves some steps that uh, maybe you don't want an end user to do, maybe they cannot do it, and so forth, is that it's pre-provisioned. So this guy is being sold with a pack of five uh, sensors, like an IP camera and, and motion detector and so forth. And it works together to set up, and there's even some, maybe some rules set up for it um, beforehand. Um, but we allow uh, the savvy user to add their own devices as well. So as long as it adheres to Zigbee, the Zigbee protocol and how to do it, and uh, uh, we, we can do it, like open the network for having a Zigbee device join it for the next 30 seconds and so on. We, you can do that uh, from the web interface um, uh, from the device directly. Um, but 
uh, so usually the service providers don't like that too much because uh, the next thing that happens when it doesn't work is that they get a phone call and uh, they have to send somebody to, to fix it. So uh, uh, when, on the other hand, when uh, service providers want to maybe upsell that package, if you have your standard package with three devices and you want to buy this, the deluxe package with you know, some additional devices, more um, IP cameras for your home, the back door and the front door, and upstairs and so on, and you can do it remotely also uh, over the TR69 protocol. So the service providers can pre-provision those devices and they can ship them in the mail and, and uh, the user can set it up and it's all uh, pre-configured or ready for it. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's the way it's normally done. Um, of course, uh, most of us would probably do it ourselves and have fun with uh, tinkering uh, with the device and set up, but uh, that's, uh, well, that's not for everybody, basically. So it's, you know, that's degrees of automation and, uh, and how to do it manually. So with the, mm -hmm. like, for example, a Nest thermostat, right? It doesn't care about all this, right? It just goes and connects to the Wi-Fi network and it directly connects to their server and they do whatever they want to do over that network. So where's the gap between, do they have to like, if I want to make some kind of a sprinkler system or something like that, do I have to now contact Cisco to release my product or? Yeah, so uh, no, well, yes, I guess. Uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, we really wanted to make this a platform so everybody can make their own apps, which that's what I'm calling an app, uh, to do like a rule that does something specific and provides an interface to it. So we provide the SDK for this device. And then uh, you as a customer can have the opportunity to develop, to develop that application yourselves in Java or Node or you know, use the, the tool chain directly. Uh, what we found out was that, that everybody thinks that's a, a great idea and they want to do it and then a week or a month or so later they found out it's super hard to do <laughs> or it takes more time than they want to uh, you know, spend on it. So then they turn around and ask, so do you have something already that we can buy? And uh, so that's why we have also partnered up with a couple of companies that provide uh, these uh, apps already that have a whole infrastructure with, uh, uh, well, on the box uh, directly and the rules and companion devices and the back end side. So we're basically providing the, the control plane of all of, all of, uh, of, uh, of the setup here. Uh, and then the app uh, provider is develop, uh, providing the whole um, data plane. like. Uh, healthcare data or, or smart energy data and so forth. Because, for instance, smart energy, that's what they want uh, to do, the, the power utilities companies, for instance. They don't care about, well, the control plane as long as it works. They really care about the data that uh, they collect. And, and they want, everybody wants to handle their data um, uh, the way like, they decide and have their own cloud server and uh, you know, have their own policies of, of how to handle it. So, so we, uh, of course, can point to other Cisco products or Amazon or whoever, whoever is uh, good for cloud services, but we really don't care about um, who the end user is picking. So it's a pick and choose model uh, uh, with this one. And this is just one Lego brick. Yeah, so uh, typically it's a full image upgrade, uh, but we can do the, uh, the JAR level upgrade also uh, on the OSGI. So you can? Yes. So you're signing the JAR as you would uh, otherwise, and so it's being verified on. That yep, yep. So uh, it usually, and it's usually ending up being a firmware update anyway, since you really want to test. Uh, um, well, yeah, so, well, as a developer sitting at, say, a um, service provider, they can do all the updates and all that themselves and test on the box and just uh, secure copy it over or, you know, do it over TS69, whatever they want to do. But as a, an end user, they don't really um, install apps on it. We have talked about, like, having a store and you can like just like you know Android store and all yeah. those uh, Apple store and so on and uh, well that's fine if there's a market we'll do it but so far uh, there's not a market for it basically um, service providers want a, 
uh, usually a, a stack that just works and that uh, not changing too much. So they're not, you know, so people don't call them too much and it's not working and all that stuff. They want a robust product. Um, so, so your current model is to do a kind of a one by one integration so that it would be Nest ready or Philips Hue ready or whatever. Yeah, well, uh, exactly. So we have integrated all these. Uh, sure, but it's uh, one by one and every new thing and whatever. Yeah. It is, more or less, yeah. And because, uh, for instance, with Zigbee and any of the other ones and Bluetooth as well, uh, you really have to test the. Uh, sensor device with the hub and uh, this guy and make sure it works because they're all a little right. <laughs> finicky and, and all of those solutions have a different integration with the cloud because that's Nest, that's you, that's whoever, yes, right? yes, yeah, correct. And uh, for instance, uh, one example, and I can just you know show this quickly, that uh, so this is just an end-to-end -end system, and uh, the uh, hub. So start from the uh, from the right to the left. So the sensors the hub right there and then the cloud side over there and remote uh, access. And uh, I don't want to go through all of these, uh, but this is a full setup with uh, security and uh, device management and so forth and cloud management uh, and that, and that works as well. Because all of the, the IoT state, uh, RESTful protocols are, are all well defined. It's the ones for the cloud that are the backbit country. You know, so uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what we're spending a lot of time on is that right side, uh, the interface to the different uh, sensors and actuators. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, for instance, well, one example is uh, healthcare. Uh, and there's a lot of blood pressure devices, Bluetooth, one, one's uh, way you can measure, yeah. you know, how it's going and, and stream it up over Bluetooth and send it back to a server and get some uh, physician to monitor it, and make sure that your progress is all right. And, and for instance, the whole uh, uh, hospital to home, uh, uh, thing that hospitals uh, like and, and security uh, or insurance companies even more that yeah, people are <laughs> getting home sooner from the hospital. So, and the, and the, the, the mm -hmm. sort of technologies on the right, so something like Zigbee is, is going away, staying, just... Um, well, yeah, let's see now. Uh, Zigbee is uh, bigger in Europe than in the US uh, for some reason. Um, so both uh, seems to be... Um, uh, out there, uh, Bluetooth is especially for healthcare, um, and uh, well, C-Wave. Uh, so that's of course uh, controlled by Sigma Systems entirely, and which is you know both good and bad, since there's a lot of uh, products out there like door locks and all sorts of yeah. and lights and so on that works with the C-Wave protocol. Uh, but um, yeah, but it's controlled by Sigma Systems, so. And also, for instance, uh, that's the whole security again with uh, the breach of, of C-Wave a few years back, 2011. Um, so suddenly people could sniff uh, at the data being sent back and forth. I think it was the, the session key uh, before they set up a session. They could see that in clear text and then suddenly you could sniff all the information. And uh, so that's one of the things uh, we cannot do much about. Like we have to rely on the security of these devices because we cannot really control that part of the path. Uh, as, um, right. as video, for instance, uh, in the last talk, um, where you have to be sure that uh, the video is uh, secured all through the path, the video path, we pretty much want to do the same here, like secure all the sense data all the way to the back end. But that first uh, you know, step is uh, pretty hard since we don't control C-Wave or Bluetooth. Yeah, or it was just that when I've been researching this, I was never sure whether Zigbee is a dying duck. Well, um, so, but, okay, so my take on it, and that's my personal take, is that sure. it'll go away and the Wi-Fi will take over yeah, in that area. Yeah, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Yeah, so. yeah. So, but it's still out there and people are asking for it and we'll happily, you know, provide it. I can't hear you, other people may be able to. Yes, so, so a question regarding the Bluetooth. So currently the Bluetooth low energy get profiles are quite limited what uh, you know you can do with sensors and various companies doing various extensions on it. Mm -hmm. um, but but it seems, you know, it's still not as standardized as people, it, it is still not as well standardized as, you know, people wish to be. So. 
So it's, it's very difficult to work with, with different BLE devices, blood pressure meters, because everyone is just implementing its own GET profile. And how do you see, how, how will this evolve in the, in the future? Yeah, and uh, good question about st standardization of, uh, well, both the protocol, but also the data uh, that uh, these uh, devices are collecting. And uh, so, for instance, uh, there are some uh, initiatives out there, because you are absolutely right that it's, you know, everybody has their own standard and uh, wants to enforce that and so on. So what do you do? So uh, our approach is to support as many of them as possible. Uh, but that's a losing game. Um, but uh, for instance, for uh, um, health devices, there's this Continua consortium that tries to do that, uh, to standardize how to uh, both uh, get the data, but also secure it all the way through the system. Um, so what we do is, uh, so then we support that Continua device stack and uh, get it certified and uh, hope that that's enough. But it's an open field and, and actually I think, um, uh, I, I can just jump to my last slide here, that uh, those are the uh, challenges again that and the standardization of protocols and data is up there. But that's one of the things that uh, the IoT within Dinara can help with, basically, to provide some good examples of how to do, you know, uh, security and, and uh, healthcare and smart energy and home automation, provide some good examples that make sense and uh, then, uh, then I think it will uh, catch on, basically. Because right now it's, yeah, everybody's uh, <laughs> guess. You talked a little bit about the provisioning of new devices, um, but could you go could you go into more details? Of, for instance, if I bring a new light bulb home, right? I don't want to be typing passwords or calling my provider to install a new light bulb, right? Um, yeah, and uh, so for instance, uh, and the, so relating to the last question, it's all different from each device how to actually provision them and where the button is located to uh, activate the, the join um, uh, feature of, of the device. Um, um, so, well, uh, yeah. I guess, uh, for instance, uh, Philips Hue lights, that's the prominent example. Uh, that, that just works out of the box because we have engineered it to work out of the box. So you can buy one and uh, push the button and uh, push uh, that, please join my network, and it'll join, and you can control it, and, and everybody's happy. You have to do that pressing of the button yourself and timing, but, uh, but that's it, and then you can control it. And that's a retail device you can, you can get. Uh, but uh, then there's other light bulbs, <laughs> C-Wave and so on, that uh, has their own you know, procedure of uh, personing, and, uh, and maybe you're luck that it actually uh, does it in a standardized way. Uh, Probably not. <laughs> and then uh, you're sitting there with your device and have to buy that hop that, uh, you know, uh, that the manufacturer wants to sell to that device. But can't they do like a new TNT thing that as soon as you plug in that light bulb, it says I'm here and this is my capabilities and it goes to the server and it does all that for you? you know, yes, yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> but, or, or as long as you can agree on the standards. Exactly, the exactly. And so, being uh, in the trust and the security is all fine. So, well, <laughs> it's all connected. But, and uh, since we don't control the devices themselves, like if we did, we would, you know, do something like this, like just send out a little hello world and I'm here and join. I mean, part, part of the issue is that the, at the point when you're the right side of the diagram before, mm -hmm. that those protocols are kind of pretty well standardized and reasonable. You know, that there's a RESTful equivalent for every protocol level in, uh, in, in the standard web. But on the, at the point you connect with the cloud, what is the provisioning and the security? It's all different. Yeah. So that that's really where the, the lack of agreement and, and big companies are making a land grab for that. You know, so Google does it. You know, yes. Google. Yeah. Um, that makes it hard to standardize. So I think the problem around the light bulb that it can be on and off. So there is a very little user experience in, in well, fact. Well, no, no, no. Uh, the, the exactly. Philips, you can the change Philips the you can be yes. a different brightness and color. Exactly. It's quite so, exciting. Really. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> for a few minutes, of course. But I, I, I think the problem is also that no, companies no. may try to, to differentiate the experience that they you are, get yes. with, with, the, with the light bulb. Light bulbs from Devo or whatever it is. You go right, closer. And they're, and they're all not into 
exactly, which, yeah. which is working against the standardization of, of, of those interfaces. I think there's a lack of standardization, standardization with the um, cloud integration that is actually driven commercially, it's not a technical problem. I mean, personally, I would probably like, you know, if I'm buying like a sprinkler system or a light bulb or whatever, then I buy it, I have the option of like, you know, my home network or whatever that gateway is, that you provide services to Amazon or whoever that is. And I, you know, my account or my home is already pre-configured and everything. I, I just have to like say, okay, I'm buying this for my house, so select it. And well, you'd, it you'd hope it would just plug in and work. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? I mean, anything else, I mean, I don't, I, I can probably do it, my, my wife is never gonna do it, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, also pretty soon it comes into more legal and philosophical questions like who owns the data and all that stuff, you know, it's a legal hell, basically, <laughs> for product. Uh, and, uh, so there are some frameworks for tying together some of the, you know, the internet mm -hmm. stuff. You can actually tie events together, but I mean, it's, it's at the moment, most of the things are tied to a particular account. So if there's more than one of you in a house, which hopefully there usually is, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've all got your accounts to play with the light bulb, but only one's in control. So, I mean, the whole thing is, is a mess at this point. Yeah, yeah. But, so I hope, uh, like, the takeaway is that uh, for the Linaro group, that uh, security and privacy is kept really up there on uh, maybe the number one uh, challenge to uh, address. Also, since some of these, most of these devices actually uh, addresses security f for the home in the first place, like IP cameras and all that motion detection and so on. And if that is <laughs> broken into, uh, we have this whole uh, scene from 2001 Space Odyssey, like, hello Dave, and uh, we don't want to end there. That's really the last place we want, because then it's game over for, for uh, yeah, this product, but also uh, for privacy in the home uh, as a whole. Yeah. More comments? Yeah. Um, my question is, there is so many uh, different uh, standardization organizations and other consortium around the world, <laughs> different companies and different uh, um, industries, you know, and uh, different uh, uh, requirements for the, from them. We also have somebody mentioned there is such as IIC, such as RED and uh, many organizations. So how can you, uh, how do you think uh, in Linaro we can address all these kind of requirements from different, uh, you know, if I might make a comment, I think the, the basic kind of sort of within the house, within the office, within the factory kind of integration protocol, Bluetooth, whatever, you know, those are all fine. I think it is where you integrate with the web and services and you have data collected by many different providers and the linkage between those. And, and you're quite right, there are many, many, many consortium and seemingly one, another one a week, you know, um, I think. Uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't help the ARM community within those spaces, it's incredibly fragmented. So um, there are a number of organizations, mostly academic ones, trying to drive very standard across this, and standards around data and ownership and security. And I think one of the, if, if a bunch of companies could kind of dis agree which standards to follow, and I think that would really help some of these integration problems. And well, and yeah, the way uh, that we address, it, address the issue is basically to support as many as possible. Um, yeah, but it, well, it would be great to. The, one of the um, okay, so for the um, IoT and embedded group, that's one of the key questions: what protocols mm -hmm. and exactly what standards do you push and follow? Yeah. But it's also true in other. IoT is not just light bulbs, right? I mean, it is, has an impact across all groups in all ways. Yeah. In sometimes quite surprising ways, if only for the protocol. Immediate delivery, that IoT gateway could also be a media gateway and you'd be doing, you know, yep. DRM um, rights, trusted rights checking, et cetera, oh, yeah. and yep. streaming. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of functionality. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think the other part of it is also on the device side, whether it's just Linux, because a lot of these devices don't even yeah, that's, but you know, you, you wouldn't expect Linux to be running your light bulb, but there are some that do. <laughs> um, so, but Linux as, a, as an IoT client is, is, is a good engineering solution, particularly when you're talking about different protocol support and security and the ability to be able to put data in those places. It's 
crazy. I mean, I've, I've seen, um, oh, well, Linux runs on my Nest controller, right? So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, you say it here. Before we agree with any standard protocol or standardization, that the purpose for the IoT like, group is to find a common ground for it is to look for common ground for and like, yeah. potentially <coughs> most of the IoT application scenarios. Yes. But even for that, I would suspect that if that would be sufficient for the if only one solution for all the IoT. For example, they were coding M application that could embed to be one of the sure, yeah, no, and embed for the uh, higher end or uh, more computing capable solutions that would be the leading edge or even more complicated yeah. solutions. Mm -hmm. so, so that is all the needs the uh, protocol they all that. Yeah, the pro the protocols provide a um, space of playing a level playing field. Right. It provides a framework within which to work and then you use the right technology for the product, for the gateway, for the network infrastructure, for the cloud, right? Right. What will pull it and you would we would all love our you know all of that to be running on our processes, right? So we'd like it all to pull together. <laughs> so the question is would Linero be going to work on something not Linux in case Yes, uh, so when I asked that question um, of the steering committee as part of the should, is there a need for Lenaro to try and standardize an open source operating system on an M-class process? And the results were fairly mixed. Um, they, they all felt that embed, embed, well, so ARM's embed is a unifying force across M, and they're using that as a way of rolling out functionality and showing how they view things should be joined together. Um, but they're not, you know, you don't have to run embed on an M-class process, you could run Contiki and all sorts of things. Um, so they're not, you know, they recognize there will be choice. So is so in terms of on the on the M-class, but everyone I've talked to about an IoT and embedded group, uh, they, they don't see that as the first problem to solve, the, what you run on your M-class. They see the first problem as uh, making Linux fit to, as an IoT client and choosing the protocols and also enabling this across, uh, embedded is a hugely wide space, so I say it goes from light bulbs to motorhomes, right? I mean, it's just little factories. Yeah, there's so many different uh, requirements for, for data delivery, and like an IP camera is different from a temperature sensor and all this stuff, yeah. Yeah, so in one sense, IoT is a set of uh, you know, standards and technologies that apply kind of everywhere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in another sense, it's a bunch of products and services, so. Anyway, the money's where the data is. So the requirements of Linux are probably a lot higher than some devices in terms of memory. Well, you, but you look at Linux on, on a medium-sized Cortex-A, 32-bit <coughs> RPG, um, you know, it, it, can, it can get down a pretty small footprint. It's pretty reasonable, it's solid, it's reliable. Um, Nicholas Peter, who worked on Looking at some work in my group has been looking at some of the tinyfication efforts that are going on. So, you know, Linux running on a on a lower power A class core is would make a perfectly good IoT client, and the, and the you know the cost would be reasonable. And you, and okay, the the hardware might be over specified, but the software is easier, and therefore the cost is lower. So, yeah, so I've seen efforts also of uh, basically uh, extending existing devices with small Wi-Fi, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Shim layers it's on top of the device it's itself, it's and then they can, you know, do the uh, collecting and yeah. just to provide a common standard I mean, based way. The with Wi-Fi, I think, is cost. I, mean, I think, you know, Wi-Fi is probably going to run your bomb to much, maybe three, five, six times higher than if you're using. Yeah, but the BLE software, the software bill of materials is always right. five or six times higher. <laughs> right. That's yeah. yeah. But if you do it once, then. You <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's going to be your Wi-Fi. Yeah. You know, the, the it's going to probably take some time to Wi-Fi cost on Wi-Fi settle to the point where you can compete with the other things. Yeah. 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 Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Very much.